Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're doing a series of lessons, as perhaps you already know, on the book of Galatians. It's proving to be a very interesting study. This particular lesson is lesson number two in this series. It's intended for study on October 8 of 2011. <coughs> it's entitled <coughs> Paul's Authority and Gospel, and I would like to begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with us? Our loving Father, as we look back to this challenging time in the early church's history, when Paul uh, spoke about the problems and the challenges that he faced in connection with the Galatian heresy, may we understand it, may we understand what is important for us to learn for our day is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> In our previous lesson, lesson number one, we discussed the historical background of Paul. We learned a number of things about Paul, of course, how he went through that conversion experience on the Damascus Road, and some of the things that happened to him after that. But now the question is, what do we know about the writing of the letter to the Galatians? Why did Paul write this letter? <coughs> to whom was it written? Now, of course, you might say, well, it was written to the Galatians. Well, what, what, who were those people? When was it written? Had Paul ever been in Galatia? What experience did Paul have with the churches in Galatia? Where is Galatia? And what do we know about the people of Galatia? Well, it turns out that the people of Galatia were actually Europeans who had come down some years, several hundred years earlier, come down across uh, Macedonia and so forth and settled into this western part of what we today would call Turkey. Um, the book of Galatians was written, and, and there's some argument about whether he was primarily, Paul was focusing on the churches in the southern part of Galatia or the churches in the northern part of Galatia. I think that argument is relatively inconsequential. Uh, we have the book, and what he said was, is what's really important. Paul started the churches, as far as we know, in southern Galatia, and he probably started the churches in northern Galatia as well, although they may have been started by others, and then Paul later visited them when he was doing his work in Ephesus, which wasn't far away from this area. The book of Galatians was written according to Ellen White and according to the SDA Bible Commentary, along with the book of Romans uh, in the winter of AD 57 and 58 from the city of Corinth. You remember that uh, Paul had had some problems with the people in Corinth. He uh, had written a, a letter to them. After working there for a year and a half, he was gone to Ephesus now, and he wrote that nice long letter. Apparently he had written a short note earlier. Then he wrote what we call 1 Corinthians. <coughs> then there were some problems, and just Paul decided to visit Corinth, probably took a ship across from Ephesus to Corinth, and was rebuffed to his face. He, was, he went back and couldn't believe the way they were treating him. So he sat down and decided, thought about what he should do, and he wrote a very strong letter to them. It's probably what we have in 2 Corinthians 10 through 13. Then he sent that with Titus, who went over to Corinth, and he didn't hear, and he didn't hear, and he didn't hear, and suddenly, finally, he became so concerned that he traveled around by foot some 600 miles to Corinth. And in the process, and in half, about halfway there, he met Titus coming back around the same way, the opposite way, and he said, yes, the Corinthians have accepted your letter, your reproof, and they're welcoming you to come back. And Paul spent the winter of 8057-58 in Corinth, and during that time, I understand, he wrote these two books, the <coughs> book of Romans and the book of Galatians. So, <clears throat> as the apostle to the Galatians, Paul believed that it was his mission to move from one major Gentile city to another, and it was his goal to establish strong centers in each of these major cities, and then he expected the gospel to spread out from those areas to the surrounding areas. This meant, of course, that he could never spend more than a, a relatively limited amount of time in each one of these major centers, and then we would move on and try to get something started in the next major center. This also meant that when there were problems behind him, he would often write letters back to those churches about the problems, about what he thought should be done about them. For our benefit, fortunately, 
13 of those letters have been preserved. They, perform, they compose approximately half of our New Testament. Paul apparently intended for these letters to be shared from one church to another. An example of that is found in Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, where it says, after you read this letter, make sure that it is read also in the church at Laodicea. At the same time, you are to read the letter that the brothers and sisters in Laodicea will send you. So it was pretty clear that Paul intended for these letters to be shared. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting to consider what the other church members, the other apostles, etc., thought about Paul and, and his ministry. Do we have any clues? Well, there's an important clue that came along some years later, about 10 years later, but it might give us an idea. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 15 and 16. And these were the la some of the last few words that Peter wrote, as far as we know, before he was hanged upside down in Rome. And he says here in verses 15 and 16, Look at our Lord's patience as the opportunity he's giving you to be saved, just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you using the wisdom that God gave him. This is what he says in all his letters when he writes on the subject. There are some difficult things in his letters which ignorant and unstable people explain falsely as they do with other passages of the scriptures. So they bring on their own destruction. Now that would be my first question I would like to throw out to you. Did Paul and I mean did Peter really think that these letters written by Paul were were gospel? I mean were 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 scripture equal to the Old Testament, equal to the writings of Moses and those other people? What does the Greek say in that verse? Does it really say scripture like yes. we use the well, word scripture? Yes, but remember the word scripture in Greek just means writings. But the question is it had that special meaning for Christians. So we have to assume that that's what Peter was meaning when well, it seems like the key word there is not necessarily scripture, but other. Mm -hmm. Other. And what we consider to be the other writings, the other scriptures. Mm. That would be the Old Testament, wouldn't it, primarily, in his day? Do you, do you think there are variations in inspiration? If, if the Holy Spirit is inspiring one person, mm -hmm. Does he inspire another person less? Well, that would be one of the questions. Um, one of the things that Paul is going to be accused of is having less authority than the other apostles. Now, if you say that, in light of your question, if you say that, if, in other words, if the apostles have an uh, inspiration level up here somewhere, does that mean, for example, that Stephen, Stephen's speech in Acts 7, which is one of the most incredible sermons in the whole Bible, would have less authority, less inspiration because he was a deacon, he wasn't an apostle? Uh, maybe it's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I have a hard time thinking that the Holy Spirit, when it's doing its work, is doing less work for this one than it is for that one and when it comes to inspiration. However, I think that some of the writings were intended to be for everybody mm -hmm. and some writings were tended to be more localized and, and more specific to given situations. Now, if you want to make a hierarchy out of that of some kind, maybe you can, but mm -hmm. I think it's kind of hard, but I think you can the one who is designed for a little area, you might say, has less authority to everybody well, than it is to, to than it does to that little group. Maybe it's less applicable in some cases. Well, the, if it's less applicable, it has less authority. Okay. Uh, and or, so, so distinguish between inspiration and authority. Okay. Or would you say this would be the other side of the question? Would you say? that the real source in, every case, in each case here is really the Holy Spirit. So if the source is the same, then it has equal authority? Well, Not if you what? define authority as is, uh, it might be localized. Okay. What about the idea that all these people have the truth, but some are more skilled to explain it more, more 
easily than others or somebody mm -hmm. somebody's can hear that person get get it out of them easier than another person because of their experiences or might it be that some of the bible writers because of their situation and their way of explaining things are easier for some people in certain cultures and certain backgrounds to understand whereas others might be more attracted to other writers in the bible that that speak to them more directly right uh, one's one's ability to to act upon the inspiration he receives in some circumstances depends upon the skill that he has mm -hmm. you know the, the qualities and the mm -hmm. skill that they have well that's that's I, important I, I think the skills and the background a person has because i think the holy spirit can only go as far as those, as he can use those things mm -hmm. i mean if the holy spirit could take your brain and or your head and open it up and pour information in it mm -hmm. Well, then there would be no reason to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could put it on the shelf and say, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom, tell me everything, and then you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it isn't like that. You have to go out and study the Bible. You've got to go out and live your life. You've got to try to see things happening. Mm -hmm. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't have a person that, you know, has a lot of resources in that direction, it's limited. Well, perhaps skills is the wrong wrong term maybe talents mm -hmm. is is a better is a better better term here the the holy spirit can be impressing us all here tonight equally but uh, some of us have a better ability to i don't know uh, communicate uh, to some, some people and other people might right. have better ability to communicate to other people and some sometimes people have a better ability to be more logical or or more rational more well, reasonable even the subjects Mm -hmm. More people, some people would know more about a subject than other people's, mm -hmm. and other people can receive those subjects better. <laughs> you well, know, this just goes on and on. The authority yeah. issue that. Uh, well, that's what we're how, talking how, about know, here. How so, does, how does how does uh, how is authority derived? Do you mm -hmm. everybody? That's, well, in in many cases, it's we, everybody just kind of agrees. Mm -hmm. You know, this person makes sense, mm -hmm. so. We're going to believe what he says. It appears, at a group can can establish an authority. You can, an individual can disagree with a group, mm -hmm. and select someone else as his particular authority on here. So it's authority seems to have something to do with confidence. However, in Paul's case, he can come up and say, you know, by the way, <laughs> uh, I met the Lord face to face, and I wasn't looking for him. Mm -hmm. He came looking for me, mm -hmm. and there's witnesses to that, mm -hmm. and and um, <clears throat> and and it's that experience is the reason why I'm here, and gives me the confidence to to you know to Hulda speak was, up. Hulda was a prophetess. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we don't have a book of Hulda. No. Now, are we going to say that she was less inspired? I hope not. No, she w she w had a message that was just as inspired as anybody else, but it wasn't designed to be canonical or wasn't designed to be put in scripture. It was for a local, it was to have authority in that local setting. area, in that setting. Mm -hmm. And so in defining authority that way, it's, it, it's using it a little differently than I think you are, where you're saying, does it have importance to me? Do I give it authority? I read. I look and it becomes authoritative for me. It's a little different sense in that the difference between trying to do for conversation's sake, trying to define a difference between inspiration and authority. Well, uh, obviously now authority is the issue of this lesson. <coughs> no, actually authority is the issue of the whole book of Galatians if yeah. you ask me. To a considerable extent, yes. Uh, no, to a big extent. Yeah. Because it starts out talking about things of authority, even an angel, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, you can go back to the road to Emmaus. Remember? Mm -hmm. Jesus hid himself. Why did he do that? It was because they wanted, he wanted them to speak of the truth, not 
show himself, and all of a sudden his authority pops out, mm -hmm. and uh, then they then they start saying, oh, "Okay, I'll believe anything you say," and yep. that's that kind of authority. I think is what what Paul is talking about that he's talking against. Okay, so now let's look at the Galatian situation. There were those who believed that Gentiles who became Christians should first follow all the Jewish practices, and of course, the one that they talked about all the time was circumcision. These people were called Judaizers. They were not, all, not at all comfortable with Paul's message of salvation by faith alone, and you can read about that in Acts 15 verses 1 to 5. Thus the Judaizers visited churches where Paul had started up congregations, trying to convince the new members that they had to practice all the Jewish ceremonial rites, including circumcision. They knew very well that this was completely against the message that Paul had taught, which is summarized, I think, very nicely in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, which it says in my Good News Bible. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. So, of course, if you're trying to make a big distinction between Jews and Gentiles, this is not your most favorite verse, right? There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Bang. Well, he just, he just doesn't leave any questions left. And Colossians 3.11 says roughly the same thing. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, savages, slaves, and free, but Christ is all, Christ is in all. He wants to include everybody, right? How, how did these Judaizers get involved, get to be part, I mean, I'm assuming they're considering themselves Christians. Mm -hmm, yes. And how did they get involved with this, uh, uh, with this group of Christians? How did they come in here are they con converts after Jesus has left? Or I guess where I'm going with this is if they, if they have, were converts of Jesus, if they were converts of the disciples, I mean, these were, I mean, the disciples were intimately connected with Jesus, and if they knew Jesus and followed him, how did they get these cockamamie ideas? I think the answer is found in Acts 15. I, didn't, I jumped over that, I didn't quote, but we, maybe we need to go back to it. Look at Acts 15. I'm just going to read verse 5. But some of the believers, these would be Christians, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, were they believers? Yes. Were they Pharisees? Yes. Stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. I think that's your answer. So, Remember, Paul so was a Pharisee. A, they didn't have a complete conversion? Well, not the kind of conversion Paul was hoping for. Well, they were, they were um, appealing to some sort of authority here. Yeah. It, it wasn't from the Bible. I mean, it oh, yeah. wasn't. No, 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 no. It wasn't from the, the new Christian ideas that were coming up because of how Jesus was here, mm -hmm. but through them as Jews. Mm -hmm. So they come out as authority and say that, okay, this is the way it is. Now, when you read about Paul, when he sounded like he was doing authority, wasn't he just tell, speaking of conclusions that he was talking from ideas that he's been trying to tell them about for a long time? And then, th and then he just tells those conclusions as if he's going by authority, mm -hmm. but he's just they're just basically conclusions of what he's been talking about from yeah. the past. Well, look, look at, we've already read a couple of verses, but look at, look at Galatians 1, and you'll see how Paul really jumped into his subject here. From Paul, whose call to be an apostle did not come from human beings or by human beings. He, 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 he can't even wait to properly introduce his letter. He's got to get straight into the subject. He says, my authority is not from any human being but from Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from death. Uh, and then he gets back to his, question, to his normal introduction. All the brothers and sisters who are here join me in sending greetings to the churches of Galatia. But then he can't wait. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace in order to set us free from this present evil age. Christ give himself for our sins in, order, in obedience to the will of our, of our God and Father 
To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then bang, he's back into it. I am surprised at you and we'll come to that in a few minutes. Paul was moved. I mean, he clearly wasn't beating around the bush. He couldn't even introduce his, you know, give normal greetings in his letter until he had to get on to his subject. Um, and of course, maybe we should read the next section just to sort of just get the full impact of where he's going. Verse 6 to 9. I am surprised at you, talking about these Galatian believers, in no time at all you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are accepting another gospel. Actually, there is no other gospel, but I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preached to you, may he be condemned to hell. We have said it before and now I say it again, if an anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Now, was Paul um, pretty certain about his version of the gospel? No, he was certain that it wasn't coming from him. I see. So, well, you just read it. Yeah, no, but... You but just if, read it. No, I, I'm not arguing with that, but, but if he's... Even if more he, than that, he's certain of the content. Yeah. Well, he's certain of the content, but, but part of the point is that these guys are coming on their own authority. Mm -hmm. He is coming in behalf of God's authority. Exactly. And so, and so you look at Galatians, the whole section of there speaking to, the, to that, you know, yeah. type of thing. So, so what is this gospel that he's so sure about? Well, um, it's very interesting that in Romans, it was written about the same time, he says these words. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't, while those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who will eat anything, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? Is their own master? It is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail, and they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days, while others think that all days are the same. We should each firmly make up our own minds. Right? Does that sound like Galatians? Well, the subjects are different, aren't they? Are they? Well, I, what's ticking him off in Galatians <laughs> I think is the fact that these guys will go against what he said just based on those other people's authority. Yeah. And, and what, that's what what's taking him on. What were they arguing about? What was the core issue that they were arguing about? Well, the circumcision stuff and all the other stuff that you needed to be to be a Jew. Well, Paul was circumcised, so why didn't he say, so what? Be circumcised if you feel like being circumcised. Because then you're, you're giving them the power that they didn't have. Also, if, these, if, if we are correct in assuming that these Judaizers are from uh, um, the Pharisaical uh, tradition or influence or, or what have you, then um, these people also uh, uh, are given a certain amount of authority because of their training and their so it's just natural to give these people um, well and 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 to a degree they they do have a certain kind of an authority. I mean authority, these people let, let me let me play the devil's advocate let me play the Judaizer for a moment they would go back to Genesis and they would say look God called Abraham and he said, do this. And right through the Old Testament, it says, do this, do this. This is the way you become a part of God's people. Now, don't you think you ought to do it? Well, my background and my understanding, you would have to, you'd have to look at that in, in the light of what was the purpose for those people oh. being identified as a people. Mm -hmm. they, they, they had a specific purpose. But um, contemporary Christian mm -hmm. uh, perception on that was 
that, that purpose is that purpose is changed now that Jesus is here. But yeah, the gospel has put a new light on those things. Mm -hmm. But those Judaizers were saying, it doesn't matter. They're all the same like they were before. But it was just like they were denying, they were denying what the Christian aspect was adding to that. They're saying you have to be, you have to be part of that Jewish culture, mm -hmm. that, that, that Jewish way of doing things mm -hmm. in order to be Say, a Christian, there's in a, order to be saved, really. Mm -hmm. That was not coming from God. That was coming from these Judaizers. They're quoting from the Old Testament. Doesn't that come from God? Well, yeah, but like I said, the stuff from the Old Testament with, without the Christian influence being put on, putting it on there is different. There's lots it's of, different. Lots of people quoting things from the Old Testament on TV today, for example, from one channel to the other that, as far as I'm concerned, probably even one another, if you listen to one another and their disputes, is Paul they lack their Pharisee. credibility. Paul was a Pharisee. And he <clears throat> knew their hearts. Yes. Uh, he knew their Act, motivation. Acts, Acts of the Apostles gives a little description of the, of the Pharisees. It says, the men who had attempted to lead the Galatians from their belief in the gospel were hypocrites, unholy in heart, and corrupt in life. Their religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain favor of God. They had no desire for a gospel that called for obedience to the word. No. So Paul, having come from that and having been educated by Jesus, mm -hmm. he knew what was going on here. Well, that's one of the questions. Where did Paul get his gospel? Now, we know that there was that G Damascus Road experience. When you read about that, it's told, the story is told three times. It sounds like it's a blinding flash of light, and within a few seconds it's gone, and he has this two or three sentence conversation between Paul and God. He obviously didn't get everything he understood about the gospel in that encounter. So where did he get the rest of it? I, I think it was kind of like an Emmaus trip yeah. when the disciples were, went back through the whole scriptures and were told about how it talked mm -hmm. of Jesus. When Paul went off to Arabia, spent three and a half years or how many, however long he was there, he knew those scriptures inside and out. He could rehearse them and he went over them and over them and, and related what Stephen said mm -hmm. to, to what he knew. And that whole thing formulated in his mind and he came out with guns blazing. And how many times did the Holy Spirit talk to him during those three years? Continuously. Yeah. Well, doesn't it say when you read Galatians, it, he spends a little bit of time on, on how he got this information. Yeah. He, he does. And when he did that, he was trying to contrast himself to these Judaizers and their authority. It's too bad that we don't have a letter from the Judaizers. It spells out their positions. We'd see it clearly. We have to sort of theorize based on what Paul says. A clue is probably found in Galatians 5, verse 12, where Paul says, I wish that the people who are upsetting you would go all the way. Let them go on and castrate themselves. Now, that might be a clue <laughs> about how he felt and about what, what they were talking about. Um, must have been very confusing to quotes the Gentiles mm -hmm. to have this line drawn. You've got to be, you have to be like this in order to mm -hmm. be acceptable. Yes. Well, there's always this feeling like um, <clears throat> with the Jews that you know these these other people that are not Jews that come into this new Christianity has to go through the step that the Jews had gone through in order to arrive where they're supposed to be. Yeah. And it just wasn't necessary. Were these, wasn't Ju necessary. Were these Judea Judaizers, they still advocating sacrifice? Human, I mean, animal sacrifice? And well, like I said, it, it would be nice if we had a letter from them, but we don't. But we do know that they were talking about circumcision. They were talking about the law of Moses yeah. and that kind of stuff. 
Now, in response to your question, Jay, what we do know is that they were only given permission to offer sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem. Right. So for sure, after AD 70, when that temple was gone and finished, they wouldn't be offering any more sacrifice. And that, if you ask a Jew today why he's not offering sacrifices, he will say, we don't have a temple in Jerusalem. Good way out. Huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe so. But here's the issue, and this is what really matters to us today. Who has the authority to say what the gospel really is? And the, the corollary is, what is really required for salvation? Well, I don't think that, that, that um, Paul thought it was coming from his authority. No, he tells you where he thinks his authority came from. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. And that's what's contrasting to the other guys, because it was coming from their authority as being Jews. Mm -hmm. And how do I know that Jim Jones, James Jones, Jim Jones is not the right authority. Yeah. That, that's the question. How do we decide who's telling us the truth? Because the ultimate authority has to be the truth. I mean, it, I mean, you know, you think about it and you go, you listen to all the arguments and so forth. When it comes down to it, when it's all done and said, the ultimate authority has to be the truth. So now... Yeah, but, but maybe he thought what he believed was the truth. Maybe... Well... Robert Schuller believes yeah. what he thinks is the mm -hmm. truth. Maybe Cardinal Mahoney yeah. is not around anymore, but maybe he believes yeah. what he is the truth. Mm -hmm. So how do, well, I, how do I find an authority that I can figure that out which is, is the exactly truth? That is exactly the question of Galatians. So we have to compare every new statement with what we know is truth from the past. And yes. where do we get truth from the past? From the Holy Spirit. Right. It gave it to the writers of, of ancient scripture? times through the scripture, through writings of Moses, the prophets of the Old Testament, uh, and And that and, and comes through so each, everybody personally. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between Galatians and those other things that you were reading about mm -hmm. in the other chapters, because he's saying, go ahead and, and do this. Go ahead, but you know, if you come up with it yourself, it's, it's becoming a personal religion for you. Mm -hmm. But Galatians here, you gotta, you gotta, uh, put yourself, you know, to the, to the authority of these other people. Yeah. What happens if I, and I think I do this all the time, I think we all do this, what happens if I pursue the truth, but uh, I've interpreted the wrong thing as the truth? Well, and, and so let, let, let's, let's pursue that. Shouldn't Paul have started out by going down to Jerusalem and making sure that he got his gospel square with the brethren? Well, he Paul out his gospel square on that road and out there in Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go down. And he don't of need to go down. It wasn't What's from it? Jerusalem. It was from the Scripture. Yeah. From the Old Testament. He was Testament. preaching some pretty controversial stuff, though. So. Is that okay? I mean. Yeah. Do, so it's all right for people to stand up in church and preach divisive stuff and split the churches in pieces and... Well, when I persecute you, it's because you're doing something controversial. You know, <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I mean, that's the way it is with the Romans or anybody else. We're, we're, we're <laughs> inferring here quite, quite distinctively here that these Judaizers were not sincere. Oh, I that think they, they were, were very, I think that they, they were, were very that they were uh, there was an ulterior motive here they were after they just wanted to be in power and so forth they weren't really seeking the truth how do we know that they weren't pursuing the truth just as 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 earnestly as Paul was it's just that Paul was more on the truth than they were <laughs> yeah but do, do people who pursue the truth come out and say I got it well, follow did. what I did. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, they, he was just, he was. They don't say follow what I do. That's the wrong one. They <laughs> say follow Christ. No, no, no. I'm talking about the Judaizers. Oh, well, that's If good. the Judaizers come out and, and he said, what if they're following the truth? Well, does anybody who follow the truth come out and, and, and say that I've got it? Follow what I say? Well. Yeah, you better be careful because back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Ah, 
Yeah. And he says, imitate me, but don't imitate me if I'm not, mess if I'm not imitating Christ. Well, now, these, these Judaizers were claiming that Paul was trying, had come up with this, all this new gospel stuff just to make himself popular. And I would ask the question, uh, when he was a member of the Sanhedrin, was he popular? Sure. Probably very popular. Did, 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 his, did he make himself more popular with his family when he became a Christian? Probably lost <laughs> them all. Apparently lost them all. So it's a pretty hard to make a case that Paul was just looking for, per, for, for, per, for, for you know, popular approval. And didn't he mention that in Galatians? Mm -hmm. That, you know, I, I actually let myself down doing this. Mm -hmm. But your question, should, should somebody get up and uh, teach a divisive truth? The answer is yes. Okay. I so mean, long but, as you're sure it's the truth. Absolutely. Well, what, makes Absolutely. It divisive? what makes it divisive? It's because people that don't agree with you and they want to stop it. Well, if, it if you had, if you preached something and you agreed and I didn't, but we stayed friends, the divisiveness would be gone. But that's what truth is for. Truth is to go where there is untruth, and that always is going to create some division. I mean, truth is not an ecumenical movement. It's I didn't come, say it was. It's come out of saying, her, my people. I'm just saying that what causes the earthquakes are people that are not tolerant of each other. It's not fun to be a prophet. No. <laughs> so let's, let's get down to the, where the rubber meets the road. What authorities <laughs> do we recognize today? Do we even ask ourselves what authorities we're recognizing today, or do we simply float along with the crowd? To what extent are our standards and decisions determined by group pressure? Is that a reliable source? A lot of questions. You want any answers? <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> well, you're talking about group pressures. What do you mean by that? I mean, how many of us decide what our Christian standard are, standards are based on what the other people in the church are doing? Well, that isn't truth, is it? That's what I'm asking you. Well, <laughs> when, when you look for truth, it's not necessarily what you think or what you think is what, how I personally put it together. I, I might so be. you're the one who has the truth? No, 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 I'm not <laughs> going to say that. I will admit that it's my personal way of putting it together. Is but there a standard? Is there a sta yes, there is a standard, and everybody is moving towards it. It's just that everybody's well, taking a different be, track. Whether they are, I'm not so sure about that one at all. Why? My, my, this God is truth. That's the majority, who we're all going the majority, to. are not going to join that club. Well, the world wondered after. Did others. I say everybody? I thought you did. Well, I shouldn't have said everybody, <laughs> but I was saying in the context of Christians who are looking for truth. Peter gives us a challenge and I wonder if we're ready to take it up. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. The other reference was 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. But have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. But do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. That sounds just like for the beginning of <coughs> Galatians, Paul's <coughs> letter to Galatians. He sounded nice and gentle. Mm -hmm. for, for the first five, three, five <laughs> words or something? <laughs> well, Paul admitted right up front that, um, that he didn't get his message from other human beings. Does that make his message less authoritative? You know, the... the, the, the you know, truth is all around us. God reveals himself constantly and all around us in ways that most of us are just totally mm -hmm. unaware of. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that, that what makes the difference is, is one's conscience. Mm -hmm. One pursues truth, and because one is pursuing truth, one obviously well, we all know, none of us know completely the truth. Truth is revealed to us day by day. Well, and, it's interesting. And we're constantly getting, if we're seeking truth, 
God's going to give us that truth. He's going to reveal truth more and more to us. So we're, we're kind of in a constant state of error to a degree, always adapting to this new truth. So, and the only, I don't know, and, and I might be wrong about this, that you have to, somehow you have, this isn't very scientific at all. <laughs> That's one of the things that science, you have to have empirical evidence to, to, to figure out where you are in this world, but um, <clears throat> maybe there's scientists listening that say, no, that's not right, I don't know, but that's contemporary understanding of my understanding. But to me, I, it just seems to me like you have a conscience, and you have to go by that conscience, and if you are, if you're pursuing, if you're seeking truth, um, that truth is going to be revealed, and you're going to alter your course heading into that truth and departing from a, a sense of error. Shall I, um, shall I back, shall I back up what you've just said to a certain extent from the writings of Ellen White? In the book entitled Testimonies to Ministers, page 119, she says, we, talking about us, talking about the people who are in the, who are in the church, must know that we do know what is truth. We must know that we do know what is truth. That doesn't allow for a lot of wishy-washy, does it? No, it doesn't. So how do we know if Paul is telling us the truth? Well, we, we know the story about his Damascus Road experience. He tells it three times. We don't have the personal testimony of anybody who observed that. It would be nice if we did. Maybe they didn't want it. Maybe they were afraid to give their personal testimony. But his, his testimony is somewhat matched by another person in Scripture. Look at the Gospel, the, uh, the book of Revelation, I'm sorry, from the Gospel writer John. The very last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22, uh, look at verses 18 and 19. I, John, solemnly warn everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to his or her punishment the plagues described in this book. That sounds pretty definite, doesn't it? And if anyone takes anything away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from them their share in the fruit of the tree of life and of the holy city which are described in this book. That sounds pretty... I mean, he didn't seem to have too much question about that, did he? It sounds pretty authoritative. Well, do you think that it, that came from his own thinking? I didn't say that, did I? Well, what would be the point if it didn't? Because it's coming from God. And that's precisely my question. But Paul said, you can't even trust an angel. So where are we going to well, go from this? Y you know, when, when you read from Ellen White that we have to know that we have the truth, isn't it important to entertain the possibility that you might be wrong? Oh yeah, but what's your response to that? It's not giving up on it. The response that you might be wrong should lead you to seek even more truth. Right. Seek even harder for the truth. Right. You just leave the door open in case mm -hmm. you've overlooked something. Mm -hmm. When Paul uh, got upset with Mark mm -hmm. and um, decided that he wasn't fit to be much of a missionary and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And we know Mark uh, turned out to be a pretty good, pretty reliable, truthful guy. Actually, in Paul's latter days, Mark yes. was there by his side. Second Timothy. So was Paul, was Paul uh, 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 not pursuing the truth of the situation here when was Barnabas, uh, 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 he, he's the one that knew the truth of the situation, and Paul didn't know the truth of the situation. Was there ever a time when, I mean, Paul met the Lord on Damascus, and from that point forward, he always knew the truth. He never made a mistake. He never had any error at all. He never had to learn or grow <laughs> or is... Well, I, I want, um, before we leave the issue about angels, who was the one who first started spreading misinformation about God? It was an angel. It was an angel. Lucifer, the head of the angels, who later became the devil and Satan. And he, his, his arguments were so convincing that one-third of the angels joined him while they were standing in effect or working in the very presence of God in heaven. So then how did Daniel know 
that it wasn't the wrong angel that came and gave him the messages that he provided. How did? Mm -hmm. That's the question. You know, how did? How did? You know? How did he know that? Unfortunately, we know that uh, that that same angel, Lucifer, the devil, Satan, is coming back, and he's going to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we better be. We better. We better get this authority thing and the truth thing pretty square in our minds. Do you think? Do you think that? Yeah, do you think he was talking about that particular angel? I think it's very likely. Because he put himself with that angel. Remember us? No. If, if we had a different, if we well, had a different... If we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a different gospel. Right, so he put himself in with that angel, so I think it what could be any angel, even good angels. What he's saying is... What he was saying there is, I am so certain about the gospel I preached to you That's that right. even if I came back again and started preaching a different gospel, you better reject what I have to say. And it's the same, even if an angel, same story, if an angel shows up at your door and says, it's like this, he's wrong. And I don't I'd think like it's to, saying that. I'd yeah. like to... I don't uh, think it is. I'd like to go at your idea that don't get too far out. You might be wrong. Uh, leave lots. Leave some room. Uh, if you take that to its logical conclusion, or to an extreme in any way, or to you, you have a tentative. I don't know what is true. Uh, I might be wrong, so I'm not going to go this way or no, go no, that no. way. What I'm talking, We're talking about is a problem. Finished. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. We have to, Paul was, was giving the opposite view. He knew, he was preaching what he knew, what he thought was right, and was doing it with force. Well. He was not tentative about it. And, and he, was, he, was, he was in that same earnest mode before he got the, the message of Damascus. He was just working for the devil then. But he took that same energy, that same conviction. conviction, and when it got turned around, he was after that. And that was based on the fact that he believed he could not be wrong? It was based on the fact that he absolutely was convinced that the words he spoke, he got directly from God. That's right. Now, the, the problem with that, with my experience, is that I had a Mormon friend mm -hmm. that I tried to talk some ideas that I had, he would not listen to them. Yeah. He was certain that his way was right. Well, that's so the I Mormon thought, says so. Okay, so <laughs> the only way that he could have even let in what I was talking about would be to entertain the fact that he could be wrong. Yeah. And, and if that's true, then it's got, there's got to be part of that in me too or else or else okay. you know I'm just, it's just random I'm so just here's, here's the issue uh, there are a lot of people out there making claims we know that all kind there's every claim that you can possibly imagine out there claims come from authority well at least when they make claims they want you to think they're speaking with authority so we have to ask one question one tough question and that is where is your evidence. That's right. That's right. And I think that's, that's the point where Paul was certain because he knew he had more evidence than the other person did. Yep. But it didn't, he didn't rule out the fact that some more evidence could still come to, yeah. to um, adjust. Not change, but add to. Adjust or add or maybe even adjust the direction a little bit, but what he was certain is that what he put together was more substantial than what they were putting together. Yeah. That's what he was certain, and that was based on what he had right then. So now I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to my claims versus evidence thing. We remember the story, it's found in Luke, really chapter 24, verses 25 to 27 especially, the story of the Emmaus Road. Now, God himself came down. He could, those two disciples, if he had just said, I'm Jesus, what are your questions? Let me answer your questions. Just like that, they would have said, anything you say, 
we accept it. Based on his authority. And Based even, on his, even, his personal authority. Even his authority there would have been, which was completely right, would have been wrong at that time because they wouldn't have understood it. They would have just said, because Jesus said so, I believe it. So what did he do? What he did was he said, look at what it says in the Old Testament. Notice how this fits with what happened in my life, in my death, and he back and forth from the Old Testament to this, to this, to this, to this, to this, and he apparently sewed that case up so well that when they got done, they knew that they knew the truth. And when Jesus sat down and raised his hands to bless the food and they recognized who he was, bang, you know, they said yes. And there was no question in their minds, they knew that they knew the truth. But, but what's interesting about that is that we're talking about authority, period. Mm -hmm. Jesus was the authority, he had it perfect, and yet he still hid that authority so that they could think it out in their own minds. So what was he well, saying? It wasn't, he, it wasn't just that they think it out in their own minds, he referred them to what we call the Old Testament. Yeah. And if, if you've got a, a philosophy or religion that doesn't incorporate that, the whole thing, yeah, but you haven't got anything had, to contribute it, to me. It happened in their own minds, whatever it was. It wasn't well, somebody that. else telling you. But he, there, Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Even if somebody comes from the grave, no. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, mm -hmm. it, even, they won't be convinced. So, Yeah. Well, we know that there's someone out there who wanted to be above God. You can read about that in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, and Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15. We know the story of Lucifer, Satan, the devil. He wanted to put himself above God, and he was willing to make all kinds of false claims. He was willing to do whatever necessary. He didn't care to try to get there. And the question, when it's done and said now, is can God be trusted, or can Satan be trusted? And then we have to decide, what has God said? What has Satan said? Well, we know that in Paul's day, as Jim has just said, the Old Testament is what they had. Is it more reliable? Do we have more evidence than they had? Is, would you rather have the Bible and all the evidence that we have spread out in front of us in terms of, in terms of commentaries and ways to try to help us, and, but especially the, the Bible itself, and, and we would say as Seventh-day Adventists, the spirit of prophecy. Do we have more evidence based on that, or would you rather have that, or would you rather have a, a, a living apostle among you that you would go and ask questions to? Which would be more convincing in your mind? Your mind would be on vacation if you have to follow <laughs> I, a living guru. Yeah, I, I think we'd better. <laughs> if it would be better to have a living apostle, God would provide one. If he didn't, I think what, he, what he's given us, he thinks is best. Mm -hmm. Or some churches have <coughs> what they would say is both. Yes, yes. Or they certainly have a living person to tell them what's truth. Well, well let's. The world's biggest cult ha is a living one. <laughs> yeah. Let's ask this question. I'm, I'm trying to just really hone in to what we need to get from this lesson. What percentage of the truths, I'm using quotation marks here, now that we believe, are you absolutely convinced are solidly based on the evidence from the Bible? Do you think you've checked them out for yourself? Do you believe that your version of the gospel is positively, absolutely, grounded in scripture. <clears throat> Does that work ever stop? No. Do you ever get to the point no. where you've got all the evidence and say, that's it? What will we do for the you rest had, of you eternity? You would have an image. You would have an idol if that were the case. Yeah. If your gospel doesn't keep growing, if your, if your understanding of God doesn't keep growing. The infinite. What can yeah. you know about the what he's revealed? Well, but it's infinite, so you should be constantly expanding your understanding. But some people think that they've got it all. Yeah. Do, is, do you think the gospel is spelled out in the books of Romans and Galatians? Pretty well. It's one of the best places anywhere in the world that I can possibly imagine. Yeah. But then again, you know, it's our lives adding to what we read there. That, mm -hmm. and, it, and it comes out differently for everybody yeah. because of their, their individual. We, we've only got a couple minutes left here. Let's see if we can draw this to conclusion. 
Galatians 1 verse 4 tells us that Christ gave himself for our sins. I immediately think of Romans 8, 3, where it says, God condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son who came with a nature like our sinful human nature to do away with sin. Now, two different versions of the gospel, views about how that should be understood, have emerged. Does it mean that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins, remove our guilt and forgive us, sometimes labeled as justification, so that we can be saved and go to heaven? Or does it mean that Jesus came to reveal the truth about God, all three members of the Godhead, so we can make an intelligent decision about whether or not they can be trusted? Would you even want to go to heaven if God is the kind of person Satan has made him out to be arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe? Ideally, we should ask, what did the gospel mean to Paul and to the Galatians? Did we, do we have any clues from these books? We've already suggested, Paul's already suggested to us that it's for everybody. He makes it very clear that we're all sinners in Romans 1 to 3. He also makes it clear that the answer to the sin problem was God's demonstration of his own righteousness so we can know the truth and become like him. Romans 1, 16 and 17 and 3. 25 and 26 is only after God has proven his own righteousness that he can set and keep us right. Ellen White summarized it like this, the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, that's what he came for. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. That's found in Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, and a number of other places. The essence of the gospel is that God is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be. He is instead just like his son showed him to be. And he says that, John 12, 45, 14, 9, and other places. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. See you next week.